as opposed to just fighting, this is the really interesting thing about Brave is, as opposed to just fighting and then being treated like an ad blocker, you're providing an alternate, there's a, there's a philosophical idea here that might change the nature of the internet yes. with a basic attention token. Yes. BT, well, maybe what is basic attention token BAT and how does it work? Okay, I'll tell the story first by saying how I came to it. I realized <laughs> for a long time at Firefox, we were dependent on this Google search deal. And I thought, you know, now that Chrome's out, maybe that's gonna go away. And they just, at some point, Google will say, you know, Firefox, you know, like old yeller, you saved me from the rabid beast. Now I have to shoot you in the head. Yeah. Done your job. Sad but true. Goodbye. And what could we do? And I think this Mozilla doesn't know what to do. This is something that I couldn't solve there, and I don't think they can solve. But I thought, why is the browser the, the sort of passive servant of these big tech companies? Why is it a blind runtime for ad tech JavaScripts, including from Google? Why doesn't it block some? And if it blocks some, why can't it reconnect users, readers, fans with publishers, creators, websites? Uh, why can't it help people make direct payments or even possibly get an ad revenue share for private ads that are placed in the browser? The ads are all placed in the browser. Some people have this sort of model that the server's painting the ad into some mm -hmm. you know, flash uh, <laughs> uh, c combined package or into some giant image, and then it all gets sent down. That's not how it works. All the ads you see on the web are placed in your browser by it calling out to various ad tech partners. Mm -hmm. And Google's among them. And, and, and so if you block those scripts, you, you break the, the advertising flow of money from the brands and their agencies to the publishers. And if you want to reconnect it directly with the user, you have limited choices. The user generally isn't gonna sign up with a ACH bank connection or a credit card. Mm -hmm. the, the publisher isn't gonna sign up the user except as a subscriber, and then they're gonna overcharge you because they want you to cross subsidize all the content and buy more than you read and all that stuff. And how many, you know, people are doing great who are big names like New York Times and the Washington Post, mm -hmm. but how many subscriptions are you as a user gonna pay for? This is why startups like Tony Hale's Scroll are trying to do a portable subscription mm -hmm. system. But by the way, just on a small tangent there, even the New York Times, it's really annoying how difficult it is to, to subscribe. Yeah. There's way too many clicks. They don't make it easy. And I had friends a few years ago, I think they fixed this, who would pay for the paper and then they'd go online and they get upcharged for the digital and they, there was no break. There was no connection between them. Yeah. Um, but publishers are not that technical and they're, they can't all get you to subscribe. You can't have a thousand subscriptions. So for a long time, people talked about micropayments. There was Blendle and the other ones which came to the US, but didn't grow. And I thought, if you have just a browser and it's protecting you by blocking all this ad tech tracking junk, it can provide you an option that uses cryptocurrency to let you support your, your, your favorite sites and even YouTube channels. And that we prototyped with Bitcoin. And that meant the user had to be of means to contribute and willing to contribute, mm -hmm. but it could be done on the Bitcoin blockchain and it could be fairly efficient, even though Bitcoin went through a period when we had this prototype running in 2016 into 2017, where Bitcoin was very congested and mm -hmm. very slow to confirm and the fees got very high. Um, and a lot of users who were not Bitcoin maximalist or even experienced, we, we helped them out by embedding a Coinbase buy widget and they had the income to buy, but it was hard. It was like, oh, do I buy $5 a month? But the fee is like 450. I better buy in larger batches, right? Yeah, right. And then they're like, I don't want to own that much Bitcoin. So it became this, this painful thing. And the real idea that I had of private ads that pay the user a rev share couldn't be realized alone in, in that kind of system. In these cryptocurrency systems, especially with the blockchain we switched to Ethereum, you can have smart contracts. The Bitcoin system is not Turing complete. So what you can do with the script is more limited. But uh, you can still do sort of clever things, um, even with Bitcoin script. What we wanted to do was sort of a, a three-sided ecosystem. We wanted users, creators or publishers, and advertisers. And we wanted the advertisers to put money in, just like they do today, but without going through the Googles and the app nexuses and all these other ad tech companies. Because those companies take out a huge cut. The Guardian in the UK once did an experiment for a month. They bought out their own ad space. They put in a pound and they were paid 30 pence. 70% was coming out wow. to the intermediary vendors they were using. Wow. Um, and that's like the opposite of what the App Store does. The App Store takes 30% and gives the publisher 70%. So pretty broken. In the old days of the Superstation TBS, the media um, owner would get 85%. So it, these splits have become 
really unbalanced and the middle players, the, the ad tech vendors are taking out way too much money. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're doing something worse, which has been noticed. They're, they're letting um, not just the malware vendors, but also the ad fraud side, which fakes the publishers, and clickbait merchants uh, come in and, and steal traffic from good sites. Mm -hmm. Because once you have a certain audience identified at one site, Jason Calcanis told me this about mm -hmm. his experience with, I guess it was in Gadget, uh, I forget what, he, what site he was running, but once he started using a, an ad partner that was sharing his audience information across multiple sites, mm -hmm. he saw his competitors stealing all his traffic. And then what's worse is the clickbait sites that just have much cheaper rates steal all that traffic. And that facilitates you know, fraud, it facilitates um, fake news, all sorts of problems. Okay. So Brave blocks it, and then we give users the ability to give back. And because we invented the basic attention token in Ethereum, we can do this three-way split. And we can give users a, a share of the revenue. And if they want to take it out, they can. Now, unfortunately for us and for all of blockchain, the regulators are saying, we're gonna have to know who you are. There's, there's the, the Treasury Department's uh, FinCEN mm -hmm. uh, agency. There's the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, OFAC. Uh, there's the um, you know other regulators in the federal government that take a very dark look at things like money laundering and sending money to someone named Osama bin Laden. So compliance starts to come in. And even now they're threatening for pure Bitcoin sending to some address. If you're a, a Coinbase, you're gonna have to know Who's at that address? You're gonna like the actual identities of people involved. Yeah. Now with Coinbase members, you sign up and they know you and they comply with the regulations. They're a regulated money services business. Uh, and um, but if somebody's using their own self custody, so called self custodial wallet, where they have the hardware private key and they're not named, and they want to send to that address, <laughs> our friends in the federal government are talking about requiring at some threshold knowing who that is. So some threshold that's unreasonable. Like, uh, it's not that big. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how this will play out. I, I think crypto is here to stay. I think the beauty of being able to send peer to peer without any bank in the middle, without any, you know, huge wire charge and two day delay and all that nonsense is beautiful. And I've used it and I love it, but we're pragmatistic brave about crypto. And we realize that anything like a revenue split we can't facilitate without being licensed in a certain way and it requires knowing who the user is. So our default mode doesn't know who the user is. It instead imputes to the user's browser some of the revenue and allows that browser to steer it back mm. to the creators. And we do have to identify the creators. But as things improve and you know, who knows how it'll play out, there, there should come a day when this, this full vision can be done more uh, fully on a blockchain. But regulations and the practicalities of today's blockchains, which are not that fast uh, and not anonymous over time, you fingerprint yourself over time. Uh, we do some of this with the browser. So one of the ideas with the basic attention token is to make a hybrid system that's stronger than blockchain alone. It's the browser and the blockchain. And the browser is this trusted endpoint software. It's this universal app. Everyone uses browsers. The bigger the screen, the more you're in the browser and the less you install you know, fat clients for things. Um, I use Slack on, on Mac OS and it's, it's like a browser. It's based on an Electron framework we used to use. And it's just, it's not that great. I, I, some of the people at Brave use Slack in Brave as a- In the browser, in yeah, the yeah. browser. yeah. I use that often, yeah. And I noticed on the iPad, I use apps less. Um, the smaller the screen, you know, the browser got handicapped by Apple and Android both, and it also, uh, you know, can be slower or not have the right, you know, affordances, the user interface or the, the security uh, limited APIs. But in principle, with the right permissioning, you can make the web browser just as good as any app. You make it be a super app. And that's part of our mission at Brave. So we want to have the economics that got captured by these big tech companies through mm -hmm. tracking and through social networks. We want to block that for your own safety and then let you opt into a cleaner world mm -hmm. where you keep your data defended in your browser and you can actually realize value from it. So the way our ad system works, I mentioned it being private, but how does that work? We don't see your data at all. All browsers are sort of the mother of all data feeds, your history, all your searches at all engines. Each engine sees the queries you send to it, but it doesn't see the others, but the browser sees them all. Machine learning in the browser that you can opt into can study all that in a very complete way and awesome. do a better job than Google does. Google has, you know, cookie and scripts across the web from acquiring DoubleClick. They have YouTube, they have Android, they have search, which is still their big revenue layer. Mm -hmm. But they don't see everything. The browser sees everything. And if it can do a good job locally, and this is not advanced machine learning, this is not TensorFlow, this is like SVMs now, mm -hmm. Naive Bayes. Um, 
then you can match intense signals, intense signals from those data feeds, the searches, the queries, the history, how much you're scrolling down a page, uh, how much you redid a search. It's all blind browser algorithm. We don't see that data. And then pick the best ad from a fixed catalog per day. Mm -hmm. And the catalog is fixed across a large population per day, and it only updates the day, once a day because new offers come in and old ones mm -hmm. expire, sometimes every week or every month. And that catalog, and there can be many such catalogs, is sold by our direct sales team. And so we're, we're making an anonymous audience available to advertisers without the advertisers tracking them. Instead, each browser is, wow. a, is a little machine learning system that's picking the best catalog entry. Now, the catalog is not the ads. Those are big, right? It's a video or a web page. It's just the link to an edge cache, and there are many such edge caches. We're not trying to protect them from seeing your IP address. It's not really feasible. We could use Tor, but we don't yet. Um, and some keywords about the ad. So it's mm -hmm. basically like metadata and a link. Mm -hmm. And that's what the catalog consists of, and that's what the machine learning picks. And the machine learning is learning about the, you specifically, locally, yes. in order to choose from the catalog of different ads. Couldn't this possibly be like a multi-billion dollar, isn't this taken on the Google ad, ad, ad? Could be. So like what, I mean, one question to ask, the, there seems to be some really profound ideas here that, that are different than what the internet has grown up to be. Mm -hmm. If Brave or something like Brave, the ideas, the fundamental philosophical ideas underlying Brave win out and runs 95% of the internet. How does that change uh, the, wh what, what are the major things it changes about the internet? So social networks and then the creatives like YouTube creators and all yes. that kind of stuff. So let's talk about that. First of all, if Brave gets 95%, I'm gonna demand a recount because I, I won't <laughs> believe it. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, we're trying to put things into web standards that can be standardized across browsers. So the main value of Brave will be the trust users have in us and our ability to give the best deal to users. So 70% of the gross ad revenue we give to the user. And if they go through that KYC process I mentioned, they can take it out. They can also give it back. They could take some out, give the rest back. They can add basic attention tokens to give back. Some of them turn off the ads because they just don't like ads, but they put in $20 a month. Mm -hmm. So I believe Zuko of Zcash Frame does that. And that's very generous because the browser is just anonymously based on his browsing, sort of keeping score on how much time he spent on this video, on that website. And if those sites verify in sort of a, like getting a domain certificate fashion, they can get paid. They can get uh, part of his $20 a month. So that vision could go big. And if it does, I hope it's across multiple browsers. I don't know that uh, they'll all compete well on the quality of the ads, the quality of the ad blocking and tracking protection. Those those are subject to competition. It'll take a while to standardize them. But I, th I think that would be a better world. It would have less counterparty risk, fewer t fee takers in the middle, really just the browser. We're taking 30%. Um, the, sort of the app store, app store split. And if we get bigger, maybe we can take even less. Social networks, creators. If you look at YouTubers, a lot of them, the indies that are getting to some size are getting sponsorship deals. Uh, they're, they're using Patreon. They're encouraging people to subscribe and give them regular money through Patreon. But that's centralized your Patreon. So there's censorship hazards. There's a 5% fee. What if that were a web standard? What if Brave pioneered it first and we took 3% mm -hmm. and we did it in a way that was through your browser so we couldn't censor it? Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Do you think it could be standardized across browsers? Can like uh, Internet Explorer come in again and... and uh... <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> protocols are easy to copy and that they're meant to be interoperable. So it's there's a risk there and, and the loyal users might be tricked into leaving you or they might, because of that distribution power, you, you might end up getting stomped. Um, I don't know. I can't predict the future. I think antitrust is back on the case finally in the U.S. and and certainly in Europe, DG Comp is doing its thing. So I'm hopeful that we'll have a period of innovation. Uh, you know, people were talking like Elizabeth Warren was talking about breaking up the tech tech companies very clearly. Um, now she didn't win, and I suspect that won't happen. But I also suspect that Google might be smart enough to see they should do something more than just put privacy perfume on Chrome. They should maybe get rid of double click or something, divest something. I don't know. It might happen. So, so Brave might inspire Google to completely change the way they're doing things. In the they're process. already doing something you, you may have read about called the privacy sandbox or um, flock, which they have this bird metaphor going, um, turtle dove, um, fledge. But these 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 systems have been very googly, kind of over engineered, and yet 
depending on differential privacy, which has weakness over time, if you know how that works, it's kind of injecting noise to hide you in a, in a crowd, but mm -hmm. over time an adversary can pull you out of the crowd. Th this doesn't look like it's gonna become a standard. Like Apple, Brave, Mozilla, we're not gonna just say, oh, Google, you saved us. You've invented the privacy sandbox, so we'll all just adopt it. Not gonna be that easy. It's gonna be more like pieces of what we do in Brave, the synonymous ad matching or the blind signature cryptography we use to confirm the ad impressions. That's David Chalm's invention. That could get standardized. And in fact, some of that is being standardized. Even Google's in favor of so-called trust tokens, which are Chalmian blind, blind signature certs. But they're not using them for ad confirmations because they don't want to blow up their own business. Um, and they need to let some of the publishers they serve have other ad tech scripts on the page. And so they're kind of caught. And this is something I realized doing Brave. I thought, What's you know Google's innovators' dilemma apart from just you know get, being mature and having trouble innovating? It's that they have come to depend on this ad tech system that has all these these vendors that are publishers rely on because publishers aren't technical enough. And I, I feel for the publishers, but I realize the users have to come first. And if you give the users a better browser that's faster, then you'll get enough users to to give back or support publishers. The speed and the battery savings and the data plan savings are significant. There's so much bad JavaScript involved in ad tech that if you block it, mm. you sort of chop off the what's called the programmatic waterfall, which chains a bunch of requests. Yeah, that's one of the incredible things about Brave. I guess you're saying you should attribute it to the fact that the the, the messy JavaScript, no offense. No, uh, right. it's <laughs> not my solution. <laughs> like, uh, is, uh, I mean, Brave just feels faster even then i mean C chrome was fast and one of the things that it was like impressive is it in it uh, showed that browsers could be really fast and brave is even faster than that which is block so much and it saves the network it's sa which means data plan it saves battery because the radio consumes your battery when it's running more to do those requests and it's just stunning how many there are like uh, some of my google friends were like oh that's just that bad site they'll fix it and you actually yeah. do a survey of web pages that's like mostly like that <laughs> i know google google engineers could make everything super efficient but they can't especially in antitrust court do it they cannot take over all the publishers and do that. They're trying with accelerated mobile profile, AMP. They're trying to pull the publishers. They're like, oh, you poor publishers don't know how to make your pages fast. Mm -hmm. Put them on our AMP system and we'll give you extra placement in the search carousel. That's an antitrust problem for one, but it's also publishers we talk to hate it because it degrades their brand. Now they look like a gig writer wrote a piece that's got Google's framing and AMP URL on top mm -hmm. of it. And they're trying to fix that too. But it just looks like a, a Google's borgifying all these publishers and they don't want to be plugged into the Borg cube. They want to build up their own brand and have loyal readers. So, you know, I'm in favor of giving the users power to help all the publishers in this little platoons and the creators.